So this uh, antiquity or uh, traces of the ancient Singapura uh, that abounds in Singapore. Uh, our friend uh, Abdullah, who is writing in the Italian Abdullah, says about, talks about Singapore's home. Uh, I think some of you may have heard it, or most of us will know about it. It's in the National Museum now. They say they found this big rock at the headland. Um, Lying in the bushes, the rock was smooth, it's six feet wide, square in shape, and it's covered with this chiseled inscription. But it was illegible because of uh, uh, degradation over the years from rain, water, or mm, just decomposing, right? The rocks do decompose as well. So only Allah knows how many thousand years it may have been. So everyone who came to see it, it becomes a little tourist attraction. It's, it's quite interesting that, you know, it's interestingly, after this, his description, Practically every European description of it is, is someone who passed by through Singapore and said, oh, a thing worthy to look at, you should go look at a Singapore school. I guess there's not really many entertainment spots in Singapore, so there's one of the few things they have to come by. Well, I suppose the same with tourists, right? They have to go to the Malayan. I don't know how many Singaporeans go to the Malayan, but they just like going to the Malayan to take pictures. So they went to look at the Singapore stone. The Indians declare that the writing was Hindu, but they were unable to read it. The Chinese claim was Chinese, but they too couldn't read it. I went with a party of people, which included Raffles. So Raffles himself went down there and sort of looked at it. And we couldn't figure it out. So Abdullah, obviously you think, uh, I think Arabic, but I can't read it. So we don't really know what this is about. But it was still standing there. And how did Crawford say? Well, Crawford so far has been one of the most, uh, 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 this gentleman has really uh, uh, penned down a lot of very detailed information in his diary. Well, it's the date as well, 4 February, again, when you talk about it. So he's walking around and looking at Singapore. On the stony point, it's from the western side of the entrance, the Salt Creek. Uh, you call it a Salt Creek. Well, it's the Singapore River, right? Uh, different people have a different opinion of what the river is. Uh, to us, Singapore River is like really big, but wait until you see the Pahang River or you go up to the Mississippi or something, right? It's very different. So in this case, you saw it as a Salt Creek. So it's tidal, so that's why it's a Salt Creek. It was discovered about two years ago. Uh, you made a mistake here, so uh, there was good records of it. It was discovered in the June 1819, so sort of aggravation like you guess, it's two years ago. A tolerably hard rock of sandstone with inscription. I examined early this morning. The stone is in shape, a root mass, and form of one half. And he talks that it actually broke in half, two parts. <coughs> the workmanship is far ruder than anything of the kind I've seen in Java or India, and the writing credits from time is some degree it's more from the natural decomposition of rocks, so it's hard to tell. But he gives a pretty decent description. And where exactly is this place? I oh, remember that very first image I showed you on 7 February. I said, keep in mind over here the little boathouse uh, lion place and the mass of the ships anchoring behind. So it's right at that point, the little, little point there. So uh, you can tell probably in 1819 they couldn't discover it because it's, the artist has drawn lots of undergrowth. It's over, overgrown with forage. So they probably couldn't see it. And that's how the stone looks like. Today, in the Singapore National Museum, uh, you can go have a look, and maybe those of you who are Italian will say they're Italian, and the Germans will say they're German. Uh, honestly, you ask me, I, I really can't tell what it is. Uh, archaeologists so far, over, or epigraphers over the past century, have been trying. There are so many accounts. Uh, the latest was, I think, in 1972, as an Indonesian Epigrapher he came and said, Oh yeah, it's actually Sumatran, it's not Javanese, it's Sanskrit. Because he's from Madan. Yeah. Right? So Madan is from Sumatra. Yeah, there's some other people, uh, a Dutch man who came and he thought he was part of a Hindi group. So as you can see, uh, it's really hard to decipher. Uh, up to the 1830s, or 1843 to be exact, I know in the 1830s when uh, PJ Bagby actually came by to Singapore in Rome. And it's still standing there. He actually talks that, oh, this is one of the few things, again, like a tourist attraction. You must see this stone when you're in Singapore. And it explains how to get there, what he, sees, what he saw. <coughs> this stone itself uh, is unfortunately blown up in 1843 when they want to widen the river and build a little bank and also build the Fort Fullerton or the gun battery there. So unfortunately, it was blown up. But three pieces were saved by a, a military man, a Colonel James Snow. And he sent it over to Calcutta. <laughs> and so it's still sitting in the museum in Calcutta. Uh, in 1819, uh, 1919, actually, in the centenary, somehow somebody managed to find one of the pieces and send it back to Singapore. That's why we still have the piece in Singapore. The other two pieces are <laughs> somewhere in Calcutta. Uh, I think back 20 years ago, the former director of the National Museum, uh, 
Professor Colonel Bachova went to Calcutta and he asked uh, you know, our Indian counterparts in the museum, the National Museum there, uh, where, do you still have this? They said, yeah, most likely uh, somewhere in a warehouse, and this would give you the image of how like, the readers were all done. Uh, it's a big warehouse, if you remember this cult, cult classic uh, movie. <laughs> It's just one of those somewhere. I, I think at some point the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Singapore should launch an, a youth expedition, right? Send all these youth of Singapore to dig through India to see what we find. Maybe not just for the Singapore stone, but I'm sure there are lots and lots of stuff which from Singapore they send up over to, or at least in Southeast Asia, send over to India. And it's sitting somewhere in their warehouse. Uh, yeah, I joked aside, I've been to a few of their warehouses in Delhi and stuff, and uh, it looks something like this. So, so they have lots of things. Right, so John Crawford uh, continues about various things of antiquities they've seen. So the only remains of antiquity at Singapore, beside this stone, which is the stone that's off, and the war and boat which he described really, he went up this hill, because the hill that's near the uh, Singapore River is a single government hill, Singapore Hill, or Raffles Hill, or later, Fort Canning Hill. So he said, the greater part of the west and northern side is covered with the remains of foundations of buildings. Wow. Some compose of big break of good quality among these ruins, the most distinguished are those seated on a square terrace, so 40 feet to the side, and near the summit hill. It's a pity he didn't give any illustrations. And of course, back at that point in time, in 1822, there's no photography, right? Uh, photography was only, I don't know, people are still debating about the invention of photography in 1839, 40s. And the first photograph only in Singapore for 1840, 41, so it's, it's, uh, unfortunately, he didn't take any pictures. I wish he had a cell phone camera on that picture for that. So he explains what, what these things are. And later he said, within the square terrace is a circular enclosure, form of rough sandstones, in the center which is a well or hollow, which is very possibly contain an image for which I look upon the building to have been a place of worship and from the appearance it all like people to the temple of Buddha. Now, why would John Crawford say such things? Uh, a bit by his background, uh, he's a medical man and surgeon. Uh, he was based in India, and of course he's quite familiar with um, uh, 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 religious culture and existing uh, temple complexes there. So he says conjecture, he perhaps looks something like that. And he traveled a bit in Southeast Asia as well. And he's seen these so this is Fort Canning. Uh, we did a few excavations for the last uh, 30 years, three decades, 84, that's where we started, uh, 87, 91, 2010. And if you go up to Fort Canning, there's a little site there you can go and have a look. It's open to public and it's free. You can read about all the excavations there. And we find all sorts of things leading to this ancient Singapura of the Mayan city. Well, some of the very exciting things are like this compass. It's uh, probably a Mariner's compass. Chinese compass, uh, which is great, because it actually says that uh, what's it, Swan, you know, compute, calculate something, right? So it could be used as a navigational compass, or perhaps for geomancy or feng shui. Look at this, because they haven't found something like that in China. Although they know it's made in China, but for some reason, they don't have such thing. What's the Jinanjin, right? The star pointing compass. Effectively, the Chinese invented it since 2000, 2000 years ago. They just used a, a bowl, put it in water, magnetize the needle, and put it in, and the thing will float, right? So that's how they get the direction. But in this case, this is the first time they've ever seen anything with the actual cardinal points and the zodiac and things like that. So, so it's, it's quite interesting in a sense. So we found this on Fort Canning or the Singapore Hill. And <coughs> This is maybe something conjecture of what it may look like based on the uh, East Javanese type of temple complexes with the little pedestals. Maybe he actually measures out, say, there are 14 of them, they manage 40 feet across, something along those lines. Uh, and today it exists a very interesting structure uh, built by National Parks of Singapore. So I guess they're trying to invoke the ancient glory of Singapore, it's like records, of this uh, shrine, uh, Karamat Iskandar Shah, so it looks something like that, uh, presently on the top. That's something how it looked like in the 1950s. And a temple for the worship of Buddha. Possibly. Uh, we didn't find this on Fort Canning itself, but we uncovered this uh, three years ago at the National Art Gallery compound. Uh, this is the old Supreme Court when they changed it to this new big art museum. We found it. Uh, this is the earliest evidence we have of some sort of uh, religious iconography. Of course, we can't say that it, because of this, this must be here, you know, people are put this right, it could just it could be keepsake, it could be anything, right? It's only one. If you find 20,000 pieces, then maybe it's something, you may have something to say. So, but this is the earliest, uh, the first time we uncovered 
archaeologically in archaeological context, something from the ancient Masik uh, Singapura period of this type of the Shatfa kind of session. So it's quite, quite interesting. So there may be some truth to, to, to what he's saying. Also, among the ruins, I found various descriptions of pottery, uh, which I really showed you some pictures. You've seen a lot of those. The archaeologists, uh, I can't say we love pottery, but that's the, the stuff we always end up with. I wish there were more silver, silver dollars, but it's always pottery. Uh, some of which are Chinese and some native. Fragments of great abundance. <laughs> In the same situation, we found Chinese brass coins. And it even dates them from different emperor reign dates and Tang dynasties, and Song dynasty, and like for lecture. So he was quite happy. He said, well, because of these coins, we can fix the date of the, the coins to the 12th century, just like Rafael said, the old ancient capital of the 12th century. Or if you believe the Sajara Malayu, you calculate back, it's roughly around that time period, right? Uh, but coins are very notorious. They tend to stay in circulation for a very long time. Uh, if you don't believe me, you dig into your pocket and pull up coins. I'm sure you can find something from 1982 or 1965. And a still legal tender, but it doesn't mean that we are 1965, right? It stands to be in circulation for a very, very long time. The earliest coin we find in archaeological context in Singapore uh, dates back to the Tang Dynasty. So that doesn't mean that there's something happening in the, during the Tang Dynasty or post here. It's just that coins continue to circulate and stay around. So these are some of the coins that we find all over Singapore. <coughs> Fort Canning, we've quite a lot. But the, unsurprisingly, the most number of coins we get are closer to the river. Why? Because of commercial activity, right? Or perhaps it's closer to the casinos. <laughs> Maybe that's, that's, that's what's happening. Uh, all sorts of pottery and ceramics, uh, like I pointed out. Again, this funny looking stoneware thing, which are uh, uh, the predecessor of the classic cat bottles. There are thousands and millions of them all over Southeast Asia and China. But nice little uh, uh, ceramic uh, plates and platters. Uh, from the Yen Dynasty, about 1400, and, uh, sorry, uh, about 1300, and uh, found them in throughout the uh, Fort Canning area, uh, down, down by the river, and by the plain and the Pada. Uh, we find all funny things like this, uh, tokens. Uh, they, are, they used to be some sort of jar or vessels or things, but it became, at some point, uh, I guess the, the, the vessel broke and they shaped it to this little tokens. Uh, till today, we don't know what they're used for, but uh, we speculate that they might be used for mahjong or casino. Yeah, that's the only thing we can think of. I, I don't know what they're used for. It goes out from uh, locally made, locally manufactured uh, candy, the water basket. Uh, we find lots of it like this. So I'm sure when Crawford went up and Warren Raffles, who lived up in Fort Canning, remember he has a resident there, they probably found tons of these things lying around. So we got lots of bodies to chew. Or sometimes they find gold, not by archaeologists, but by uh, by the workers who were building the reservoir on Fort Canning in 1926. They were building the this service reservoir up there, right? The reservoir. So they were building this reservoir and they uncovered this cache of gold. So this was considered a national treasure for Singapore. Uh, statistically, it's dated again to the sort of Singapura to Masi period in the 1300s. So it's a very East Javanese, uh, very Majapahit-like design. So uh, that's the thing. It's interesting. This is the first gold we ever uncovered in Singapore, uh, officially. Uh, unofficially, we don't know, right? So, so surprisingly, at that point, uh, we were very fortunate that the British engineer, uh, one of the engineers responsible for the waterworks, was on site when these things were found. So otherwise, it would probably be melted down and become someone's gold teeth or something. Like that. So, I don't know. So still at the National Museum, uh, you can have a look at it, right? Fancy. <laughs> and John Crawford on the same day walked, well, he'd been walking quite a bit on, on the 4th of February. So what, what, what else do you have to do, right? It's, it's like those tourists, you come to Orchard Road, you walk to Ion, to, 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 to Paragon, and then to Tanshima. So he's just walking around and he says, another terrace on the north uh, of the hill, nearby seems the uh, same site. It's said to be the burying place of Iskandar Shah, the king mm. of Singapore. So over the supposed tomb of this kind of a root structure has been raised. So even at 1822, right in the early founding period, someone already has put up this structure, uh, sort of little shrine. And today it continues to still there. Uh, and all sorts of people goes there, you know, uh, uh, people who uh, uh, Muslims, Hindus, Chinese, and today it's still the same. All these guys go there and they ask for favors, particularly they like to get uh, four digits or numbers. Uh, if they do that, you can go and look for them, they're still there. 
it, there's a sign there that says no praying, no incense, and uh, no feeding of pigeons, but they still do that. So that's how it looks like. So like I mentioned, the National Parks Board uh, have structured this thing more based on this of, uh, on uh, whatever uh, records by John Crawford, they say the little pedestals and stuff, and influenced a bit by uh, East, uh, the, the Java Nista design. Yes, the uh, Iskandar Shah's tomb. Now, Iskandar Shah, of course, most of us will know, is supposed to be the last king of Singapore and the first king of Malacca. Not Malaysia, but Malacca. <laughs> so, Malacca, and apparently, I don't know why he left Singapore, there are various reasons he fled Singapore. <coughs> Excuse me. Some people say the Japanese were after him, some say the people of Thais uh, were after him, and then he fled up to Moa, and then he settled in Malacca, saw the mouse deer kick the his north since the river and he built uh, empire there, right? <laughs> so what chances are that he'd be buried in Singapore, even though he's last king? Now when Malacca started growing, Singapore started became a more provincial town, uh, more of a backwater. It was still part of the Malacca uh, Sultanate or the Malacca Empire, but it becomes an outpost, so it's no longer the main trading center. Uh, so what are the chances are that he's buried in Singapore is probably zero. Uh, at that point, since he was the first uh, <coughs> Uh, king of uh, Malacca, he actually established contacts with uh, the Ming, uh, Ming Dynasty. And there was good temple records of how he made several pilgrimage, uh, several diplomatic missions to China. The Chinese court records actually have said this guy came here with his entry rush, blah, blah, blah. The emperor saw him and things like that. And at one point, there was, a re there was an entry that his son went to pay homage to the Chinese emperor. He was continuously saying, oh, my father has recently passed away under new ruler. Please continue to do business with me. It's one of those things, right? You, know, you see a paper, uh, the new president also go to this country and shake hands with someone else. So they, they, they do these things in the, in the land. So, so it's unlikely that he's buried there. And all the more so I know it's not just unlikely. I know it's not possible because we excavated around there. And uh, this sarcophagus looking thing, uh, it's just concrete. There's nothing inside. And uh, the, we dug around there, and if it's you know, a tomb or some sort of residential area, chances are you'll find uh, remains and materials we chucked around. Like, you know, rest of Fort Kenny, you find also pottery coins and things like that. But there's nothing there, so. But, but it's, a, it's a good site to get, the, uh, to get your, your dreams and fantasies uh, 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 fulfilled. <coughs> But even back then, like you said, even 1822, even earlier in Raffles time, people are going up there to ask for favors. So it's seen as a kramat, a holy place, not so much as a tomb, but some sort of spiritual place. Right, so now, I guess in a way, Raffles, uh, it's right. It's not just a fantasy, but there are all these things. Unfortunately, we don't have a record of him seeing those things, of him picking up those artifacts himself, but there's a little brief reference to to in, uh, by uh, Abdullah about how he went to see the Singapore stone. Now this is interesting because we know that Raffles, while he was in, in, in Java, he actually collected lots and lots of material. When he was in Vancouver as well, he was interested in local culture, the local heritage, the, 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 the everything. So he was interested practically in the form, from, from, uh, from the botanicals to geologicals, and so he's interested in everything. But surprisingly in Singapore, it's, it's silent. So chances are, all these, all these uh, information or that he has collected has been lost or is still sitting somewhere in, in the UK or maybe in Scotland or something like that, so hopefully it might be discovered. Now, the next thing we jump forward, and this again is one of the letters from the view archives, on display upstairs, he came to Singapore the second time and he wrote to the Lord Hastings, the Governor General. This is his description, he said, the country has assumed a new appearance since a few months later, the harbour is filled with shipping and our defences are already very respectable. So a lot of rah, rah right? The population of no less than 5,000 souls has accumulated, uh, increasing daily. Ambassadors and chiefs from different native states and business have come here to establish diplomatic missions. Oh, it seems like this, this is amazing. It's almost like a, uh, a startup company and your stocks just shoot up. Some, so something like that, right? So the principal battery has been completed, the gun battery, the guns are the cantonments are spacious and the troops healthy. Provisions in abundance, and so he goes on and on. Oh, how great this place! Notice it's just a uh, barely four months after, right? So, oh, well, well, let's give him uh, some benefit of, of the Dow. 